I think maybe we should give both of us should give advice to people, make more jokes during talks because that makes your talks <laughs> better. That makes your talks better. Like whatever, whatever you're gonna do, make jokes. Not that I think I'm not good anymore. I just thought I'm nobody. Like I just do not exist because if right now you think that you will not have enough ideas to write papers, I think in three years you will be in trouble. Which one to write? Ah, you know, he should uh, he should learn about Scottish whiskey. You know, it's a it's a it's a very old and traditional drink. You know. Welcome to Mat Life Balance. Today, our guest is Irakli Pachkore, a lecturer at the University of Aberdeen, working in hemotopy theory. Welcome, Irakli. I'm excited to chat oh. with you about math and life. Hello, thanks for thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I think this is a this is a cool channel. Everybody should watch this. I will try to advertise this later, uh, and uh, and I'm really happy that uh, I get an opportunity to uh, have fun here. Yay! Thank you. I'm glad you agreed <laughs> to chat. So, tell us about your background and what brought you into mathematics. So, I think everything goes back to the uncle of my grandfather, beginning of 20th century. So this guy, his name was uh, Terenti Shamugia. I don't, I mean, nobody has heard this guy probably, uh, but I just want to mention his name. Uh, this guy was a mathematician, a young mathematician, at the beginning of 20th century uh, in Georgia, where I'm from. Uh, and, uh, and he was a very talented guy, as far as, as I know. Uh, he even maybe had some theorems in math and some discoveries even in astronomy, they were saying, like some of my relatives. But unfortunately, this guy died very young, like very young. He, I think he died from TB and, uh, and, and basically couldn't do anything in his career. I mean, uh, he couldn't even finish his studies, I think. But now because of this, uh, uh, my grandfather, for example, uh, himself was very motivated to, to learn math and he almost ended up studying math. But, uh, but then the thing was that uh, my great grandmother who was a, mother of my grandfather and the sister of that mathematician didn't want his son to study math because there was some superstitious belief that if you become a mathematician, then you might get sick or something like this. So my grandfather wasn't allowed to become a mathematician, even though he really liked it. But what he did instead, he motivated his son, my father, to become a mathematician and, uh, and uh, we encouraged him a lot. And, uh, and, and my father became a mathematician. And I strongly believe that the reason why I'm a mathematician is that my father is a mathematician. So, but I'm also the only child of my parents who is a mathematician. I have another two siblings, a sister and a brother. None of them are mathematicians. So I'm sort of continuing the family tradition in a way. So that's one reason. The other reason is I had great, great teachers in the school. I had great teachers in the school in Georgia. Uh, maybe I should mention even their names, if they ever watch this video, they're going to be happy that I mentioned their names. Uh, Georgi Kobachidze, uh, Gogi Jabauri, Manana Jabauri, these people were like three main teachers I had in the school. They were amazing. Like they were really motivating you to learn maths and solve some problems. And like, you know, uh, this was really fun to do. And uh, yeah, so I blame my dad and I blame my teachers for becoming a mathematician. Your family story is like an actual saga. Doesn't sound true, more like an epos kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah. I mean, also the funny thing is that like the mathematics research as a such in Georgia started indeed like beginning of 20th century. There was this guy, his name is Andrea Razmadze, who was the first official Georgian mathematician. I think he was even a PhD student of Jacques Adamach in, uh, in, in, in France. Uh, and this guy, this uncle of my great grandfather knew this guy and he was even his student. So in this sense, like my family or my ancestors were involved in math at the very beginning of math in Georgia. So that's kind of, uh, it's kind of cool. So I like, I like to tell that story, but I don't think I have told too many people that story. So, wow. so yeah. So everything goes back to this guy. I'm, I'm happy about this. I still have to dedicate him one paper one day when I write. I think he deserves that. <laughs> You're waiting for a special paper? I think so. I think so. Yeah, like a very good one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Still haven't written one. <laughs> Still haven't written one. Still has to come. Let's see. 
<laughs> oh man, do you think that it's possible to recognize your own paper as a very good one? Ah, uh, it's a very difficult uh, topic. Uh, yeah, probably not. You know, I always feel like every paper I write, uh, uh, it's just not good enough. Uh, yeah, uh, I always appreciate when others tell me that I actually wrote a good paper. So it's very nice when others tell you. I think Thomas was talking about, I watched this interview about the feedback and I think feedback is very important. Otherwise you think like, you just did some random thing and like nobody cares, you know? <laughs> it's hilarious. Thomas said this one thing and then every second interviewee gets back to this one quote of Thomas and says... <laughs> no, I think he's right. I think he's right. I mean, usually this guy's right, you know, but uh, especially on this thing. <laughs> I don't understand why people say so many things and only this one quote of Thomas gets... Uh, <laughs> feedback in the next interviews. Yeah, used all over, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> we'll make a saga of our own. Maybe I should add a question to each interview. What do you think of that quote of Thomas? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. I completely <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> so it's it's uh, also fun to uh, have a parent that does uh, that does math research. So you can sometimes even talk about some math with your, with your father. Like Did he give you any advice about math research that you found helpful or teach you something? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. I mean, at the very early stages of my, my career, he was very useful. I mean, I never, I never admit this in front of him, but maybe when he watched this, uh, he, he will be happy that I say this. Uh, yeah, no, he taught me a lot of things at the beginning, like uh, what's the right way to go. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of the things I remember he always taught me is to learn as much as possible, not to just focus on one thing, but just try to expand knowledge. Uh, uh, also to start writing maybe the papers a bit later in my life, rather than very early, try to uh, expand the knowledge. Uh, and uh, in general, he also shaped the uh, uh, like somehow my, my taste in math in the sense of like, for example, that I after all went to the direction of topology was also kind of his, uh, his influence because he's an algebraist and he doesn't know algebraic topology so well. And he was always saying that he struggled to learn algebraic topology. So he told me that like, maybe you should actually learn algebraic topology because it's fun. You know, and this started from there, but, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, he was very useful. Uh, he was also the first person who taught me homological algebra and category theory. I actually remember the first time I ever had any anything to do with category theory was a, was a fun thing. We were my my grandfather turned ninety or something, and we were sitting in a train, my dad and me, to uh, to visit the grandfather to congratulate him his ninetieth birthday. And we had these seven hours in in a train. You know, like Georgian trains are super slow. They are like take. I think seven hours to cover like 300 kilometers, you know? And uh, and in these seven hours, he said like, what are we gonna do now? And I'm a second year student. I have never heard anything like category or anything, but but I've, 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 seen, some, uh, I've seen some algebra before that. And then he said, okay, I'm now gonna explain to you what's category theory. And the seven hours, he says nonstop told me things about categories, functors, this and that. And it's just like after seven hours, my head was exploding. How can you handle seven hours of math? That's incredible. It was, it was, uh, at that time I had a, I have to say that in a, at that time as a student, I had more enthusiasm than, than I even have here now, you know? So, uh, so I was super happy to just don't stop do that. It was really, really exciting. But I have to say that half of it, I didn't understand it at, at that time, but you know, uh, then eventually, then eventually, ah, after maybe two years after that, ah, this is what my dad was telling me when I would, Sort of, you know, <laughs> understand what he was telling after two years. <laughs> so that was another fun story. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is funny. It is funny to have this kind of uh, people in the family knowing stuff. Yeah. Is he proud of you? That is. Uh, not sure. I mean, uh, I think you. I think he always expects more from me than 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 uh, than than I I will ever achieve. So you know. Uh, yeah, maybe that's a question for him, not for not for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he likes to criticize me. You know, which is good, which is good. Um, in my family, it's the opposite. 
I guess I criticize myself too much. So last time I was visiting home for holidays, I was complaining to my parents again how I don't understand any math. And dad listened carefully to all my complaints and then said, I hope you go back to Zurich soon so that we can be proud of you again. <laughs> That's a, that's a never never ending story, isn't it? Like whatever you do, and then the next day you get stuck on something you feel like you have never done anything in your life. Right? I mean. uh, but I wanted to ask. So um, you mentioned the expectations of your father. So was this pressure for you an issue? And uh, no, no, actually not, because I really liked this so much doing this. I mean, I I really loved it. Like all this. Even calculus, I really liked calculus, for example. Until today, I really like analysis. Uh, even though, unfortunately, I don't really use it much. Um, uh, but there was no pressure because I was so uh, poisoned with, uh, with maths that uh, there was mostly discussions about that, hey, don't work this much, you know, take it easy. That's another, that's another thing what, what my dad was always teaching me to, to take it easy and not go crazy, you know. So one of the things he was always telling me is to uh, not to uh, work too much and also do other things. And, uh, and that helped a lot, of course. How did your passion evolve throughout the years? It's an interesting question. Like, I think the most passion I had as a student, I think as a student, I just couldn't stop because like there was so much thing, so many things to learn and, uh, like left and right. And, uh, uh you just, uh, couldn't stop like looking in this book, in that book, you know, and, 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 uh, then also as a student in Bonn, I was also pretty much like that, like a lot of a lot of excitement and stuff. And I have to say, I'm still very excited about it. Uh, so like, where, for example, when I have some problem to think about, I just can't stop. Uh, uh, but the difference, what I see now is that uh, as a student, I couldn't have a day. I couldn't have a day when I wouldn't think about math. I just couldn't do it. I was so addicted to it. But in our days, unfortunately, because of all the other things we have to also do, which I consider one of the big problems of, uh, of, of our lives as mathematicians, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, if you have a day when you have to write emails, correct exams, and you spend the whole day on that, you know, you somehow learn how to have days when you don't think about math at all, you know? So, and, 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 uh, and in meantime, in meantime, I can have days when I don't talk at all. I don't think at all uh, about math. I mean, this is just, uh, this is just unfortunately uh, part of the job, uh, yeah. And and I would say the passion is still here, but uh, let's say addiction, addiction is less somehow. <laughs> addiction is more control. Let's say like that. <laughs> does it does it feel different for you at the end of the day if you didn't do any math? Does your brain? Yes, yes, it feels pretty bad until like. Still, like if there is a day I didn't do anything useful in math, let's say math in the sense of research, or maybe let's say good teaching as well, I count it as a good math on that day or good talk or something. Uh, end of the day, I feel always bad. Yes, I feel kind of guilty for wasting my uh, abilities. Uh, I don't know why, but maybe it's the wrong thing and maybe people shouldn't, shouldn't listen to this. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I always feel like kind of like I wasted my day, you know, I wrote these five emails and then did this admin and nah, no, that's not good. <laughs> but yeah, often I just decide from the way I feel in the morning, like what am I gonna do today? Uh, and unfortunately I have zero structure. If I tell myself I'm gonna do this until four o'clock and then I'm gonna do this after four o'clock, usually I can't stop if this is math until four o'clock, usually I can't stop. So at some point I gave up about structuring anything in my day. I just uh, do whatever I feel like. Uh, and I think it works okay. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe I overestimated when I over exaggerated when I said structuring. I also, I also decide every morning what I want to do, but I try to remember that if I decide that I want to do only math today, it will be as bad as if I decide that I don't want to do any math today. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you tell how your collaborations work? How the place where I really learned to collaborate with people was Copenhagen because I was a postdoc there three years and there were a lot of other postdocs 
at the same time uh, together with uh, me there. And, and this kind of environment uh, encouraged us to collaborate. I mean, this is a wonderful place where they were hiring and I think still are hiring uh, young people. And, uh, and uh, we, we were talking constantly math with each other. And, and this, is eventually, this is eventually how it started. Uh, I, I, I learned to discuss math with, uh, with people and like some random places, even though in Bonn before where I studied, it was also pretty good. But like Copenhagen was just like all these like 15 postdocs together hanging out and they just have nothing else to do but do math and drink, you know, and, uh, and, and so this was, this was just like a super good environment to start collaboration. Uh, yeah, so eventually the way it worked for me, I got lucky to end up uh, collaborating with lots of people that were at the same time in Copenhagen as I was in those three years. And somehow that, uh, that uh, let's say, that thing is coming with inertia somehow until, until today in my life. Uh, but how does the process work like in practice? Oh, the process is, I think, I mean, I know you have collaborated with, with many people as well. And I probably would be guessing it will be similar what you do. Like, you know, you have a Dropbox file, somebody texts, somebody types up something, then you see it, then you feel guilty that you didn't type up your part and then you start t- typing up, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, the usual thing, you know, like uh, we first talk about things. Uh, we discuss uh, maybe some months that these are the ideas and stuff. And once we see that there is something concrete coming out of it, then we start typing it up and then everybody does their sort of share and uh, in, the, in the Dropbox. Uh, the, the, the thing is also that uh, I think collaborating with me uh, usually means that, let's say on average, your papers contain less mistakes. I mean, I wanna praise a bit myself because because I am extremely paranoid about making mistakes in my papers. Like, I, I'm not even sure it's a healthy, healthy paranoia. It's definitely unhealthy, you know, like I can spend like days, maybe weeks just rereading uh, some paper I'm writing just to make sure that there are no mistakes. I'm still sure there are some mistakes in my papers, unfortunately, and that makes me really angry. But, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, usually, uh, usually I'm the I'm the cop in the projects, you know, like someone checking everything, you know, and trying to like <laughs> make sure that nothing goes wrong. Yeah, so uh, in that sense, I'm not uh, sure it's very pleasant to collaborate with me because I have annoyed my my collaborators with being too uh, too paranoid about mistakes. I see. Well, I see one difference with my collaboration in that my collaborators do not allow to use Dropbox, we use GitLab. So it's cool. It seems like you don't have an ever a feeling that you aren't really contributing to a paper if there are more people. Uh, yeah, I mean, if there are more people, I always feel like uh, the things become one way, they become easy because uh, you have more people and more ideas and uh, more people doing things. Uh, on the other hand, I think the maximum I've ever written is like five authors in total. But I mean, you know, there are people with uh, seven, eight, nine, something like that. Uh, uh, but I also feel like sometimes things become more complicated because you expect others to work and they, they don't do anything and everybody expects someone else to work. And also eventually everybody expects that someone will check it, but then nobody checks it. I wanted to ask you about that. So. Um... There is a stereotype that um, Georgian people easily get uh, used to a different culture and adapted. Oh, whereas that's a very interesting uh, question. So you know, you probably know this because because of your background, right? So that's what I was about to tell. The stereotype is that meanwhile Armenian people have it very hard uh, time with assimilating. And while I don't uh, in general trust uh, stereotypes, but uh, my grandfather, who was born in Tbilisi and lived in Yerevan and then moved to St. Petersburg for a PhD and lived there ever since, somehow never got quite used to the surrounding reality and accepted it. So he would only speak Armenian to me and insist on it. And he would always call me Mariam, Mariamik. 
<laughs> so I'm but, curious, uh, was it easy for you to adapt to new countries? Uh, uh, first of all, I need to agree with you about Georgians being uh, pretty quick in assimilating. Uh, yeah, so for me, I would say the first year was difficult when I went to Germany, that was in 2008. It was difficult, uh, despite the fact that again, right away, I was in an extremely comfortable situation compared to an average, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to use the word average, let's say uh, uh, just as some student that goes to abroad. I mean, I was right away like treated as uh, very nicely from, from, from people there in particular by my advisor, Stefan Schwede and, and some others there who right away gave me an office because I came from Georgia. They let me hang out with uh, uh, other master students and PhD students that really took care of me that I had a smooth uh, situation, you know, uh, to, to transition from Georgia to Germany. But despite that, the first year was difficult because, you know, uh, it's a new country. Uh, this, I spoke German when I arrived there, but, uh, but that helped a lot, of course, but still it was just adapting to the new reality and you know everyday routine changes and all these things uh, and then you miss your uh, your country where you lived like 20 years and so on uh, yeah it was difficult at the beginning but then uh, then uh, eventually i got pretty comfortable with uh, with uh, with uh, with germany for example let's say i got used to comfort pretty quickly i don't know if it's good or bad <laughs> So you made peace with not returning to Georgia? Uh, at this point, yes. At this point, yes. Maybe when I get older, I will uh, become more nostalgic. So since you moved uh, several countries and since you seem to have lots of friends, I'm curious, uh, how do you make new friends when you arrive to new? Obviously, I become quickly friends with people I work with if if they are nice, let's say, and most of them, most of them are nice, you know, or at least I'm trying, I'm trying to, uh, let's say, uh, approach them from their nice side and then become friends. Uh, but uh, I also, um, I also do other things, you know, I, for example, uh, for example, I, I play a lot of tennis and in every country I, I, I lived, I right away joined some tennis clubs there, you know, and then uh, that's another way of, uh, of, uh, of making new friends. So now the, the, the majority of my friends in this town uh, are either mathematicians or tennis players, you know, so. I also join tennis clubs, but somehow people there seem to have very different life and interests. Uh, you also play, you said you joined the, very good. Yeah, I always like when people play tennis, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's another uh, huge uh, passion of myself. Like, to be really honest, I'll, 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 I'll tell you now a secret. As a kid, I always wanted to become a tennis player. But obviously, that was impossible because you have to be really good to do that. Um, and you have to have a lot of money too. Uh, so none of, none of, none of that was, was around. Uh, but no, it's still my, one of my biggest uh, passions maybe could even compete with my passion in math, you know, uh, sometimes I'm not sure. There are days I'm not sure I'm a tennis player or I'm a mathematician, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and, and I, and also a lot of people blame me about bragging about uh, playing tennis, you know, so. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's too much, you know, people make fun of me like, oh, this guy always talks about tennis. Can I try to make something cheesy in this video? Sure, sure. Okay, let's see. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> hey, if you're watching this and live in Zurich, please write to me if you want to hang out or play tennis because I still know very few people in this city thanks to lockdowns. Oh yeah, of course, of course, yeah. And it's also like a nice part of mathematicians' life because like this kind of life, what we have, you know, moving around until you settle down uh, it's actually also i mean it is a bit stressful I, I agree because finding jobs and all that but but if it's working out then then it's actually fun because you're discovering new cultures new places new towns new people new environment and that's uh, that's i think one of the nicest parts about being a postdoc let's say yeah, that you sort of discovering all these new places <laughs> yeah yeah, I guess people get very stressed about looking for the next. 
That is, that is, that is definitely true. And I was also stressed. I mean, there is unfortunately uh, no way to avoid this. So in my opinion, one thing that helps is not to think too much about it. And I, I know now I sound a bit arrogant because, you know, I went through this myself and I'm not in uh, that kind of a danger as maybe a, a postdoc would be, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, one thing that really helps is just try to do maths and, uh, you know, uh, not to worry too much about this because, uh, because, uh, uh, because, yeah, you have to also enjoy that time, you know, like if you constantly stress out yourself about like, oh, am I going to get the next job? Am I going to get the next job? Despite the fact that I used to also do this. Uh, the main thing is to enjoy that time of uh, being a postdoc. And uh, so getting back to your earlier days, I'm curious, uh, can you remember the scariest or hardest exam that you had to pass in math and how was it? Well, I mean, uh, I never had any problems to like just deliver under pressure, let's say like this, uh, uh, when it comes to math, because I was preparing really well, usually for exams, like I would just go through everything, all the arguments, and then I would just go in and, uh, and, uh, and write, uh, write, uh, write an exam. But funny thing though, what was happening occasionally on these exams, I was helping some of my friends uh, who were not maybe as motivated to learn math as I was uh, to cheat on exams. And, uh, and I would may help them to rewrite the solutions I wrote up. You know, sometimes I would write my solutions with big letters and then like this, le this exam invigilator or, 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 or uh, oops, I'm admitting now some criminal activity here on your channel, so I might get I might get in trouble. But so I would write my my solutions with big letters, and this was kind of this lecture theater type things, you know, where we had these exams. So somebody, some people like here from the left and right, sitting above me, would see what I'm writing <laughs> with the big letters. I mean, obviously, this this uh, teacher or professor was wondering like, why is this guy writing these huge, huge letters, and then. I mean, I would I would usually explain this with my glasses because I have really bad eyes, you know. But like, oh, you know, I have these glasses, you know. I have to write this with big letters, otherwise I don't see it. And then then these people would see what I'm writing and would rewrite it. I mean, half of the time they would get it wrong, but half of the time they would get it right. And whatever they would get, they would increase their points. So so this is the fun thing I remember from exams: organizing somehow to do it in such a way that others see it. But uh, I'm uh, I'm not super proud of this, of course. I mean, nowadays I wouldn't do it because it's it's kind of cheating, and I discourage students to do this. Don't do this, especially my students. Don't you ever do this. But but uh, but uh, <laughs> but but I I used to do this, and, and and now I just remember this as a as a fun. But I mean, otherwise otherwise, yeah, I was never nervous with exams. I can tell you one thing I get very nervous about and, and I, under pressure, I perform really badly. These are not exams. These are when I have tournaments in tennis. When I have tournaments in tennis, I can't recognize myself. I suddenly become so scared and nervous and, you know, like I just, I'm, I'm just not myself. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, and right now, even even right now, trying to work on uh, my uh, psychological stress I get uh, while playing tennis tournaments. So when you were starting your PhD, I guess you had some idea of mathematician's life, especially thanks to your family. Yeah. Uh, but what turned out to be, what were you afraid of in math and what turned out to be easier than you expected? Uh, I was very afraid of right that I will not be able to write papers that I will not have ideas to write papers. Uh, and I remember this even after PhD, I was very scared of like, now I will get stuck in the subject of my PhD thesis and, uh, and, uh, and, and I will suffer. And, and, um, and in some ways this became true. The first year when I was in Copenhagen, for example, I was still thinking about some continuations of my PhD thesis and, and it was really, it was really bad in the sense of like, uh, I was kind of very uh, annoyed about this thing that some things I was trying to do were not working out. And I was kind of not really looking at new things. I was still stuck in the same thing. And I thought that this is becoming now reality, what I was afraid of from the beginning of PhD as well until the end. 
to be afraid that uh, once uh, uh, once I don't have say my advisor around, I will not get any new ideas what to do. Um, but now I want to tell other people in the same situation that no, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen if you are hanging out with the right uh, people around you. Uh, eventually, by talking to these people, you get some ideas as well as you get uh, encouraged to uh, uh, learn new things. And at some point, I decided, okay, now it's enough. I'm just going to sit down and read some new things. And so I think I spent around half a year or something just reading stuff, just reading stuff, learning new things. Uh, and then eventually, uh, eventually uh, starting to collaborate with other people as well as writing my own papers. And then eventually the problems I was stuck my own and it also suddenly uh, got solved because I was more, uh, you know, uh, I was feeling better because I was collaborating with other people. I was already doing new math, completely new math than I was doing before. And then suddenly, because you are on this uh, good uh, mode, somehow you, you also uh, then can solve some of the problems you couldn't solve before uh, you're on your own. So, so that was, uh, that was uh, quite nice. So that was the most difficult uh, time I would uh, say the time when you are scared of like not being able to uh, deliver somehow, not being able to come up with new ideas, write new things. And I just have to want to tell this to younger people that no, don't get scared. You know, the idea is going to come to you. Uh, the new maths going to come to you if you just start uh, reading new things and uh, just learning new things, just as a good old student, you know, sit down, read something, then you're going to get ideas. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to believe in that when you don't have yet enough experience. In it. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, like to believe that you can do it. Yeah, I completely agree with this. I mean, you. I mean, I even remember uh, that was probably one of the last uh, sort of these type of conversations. Uh, uh, I mean, I still talk to my dad about math or math life or something like this. But I think this was the last one, uh, last sort of very good one I remember with him um, where where it turned out that what he predicted uh, is going to happen in my career actually really happened. So I remember just after PhD, I went to Georgia and we went together. Uh, we actually went together to a church and then we got out of this church and, and, and we had, we, we like to have some philosophical discussions in these kind of situations. So, so, uh, and then I was, I was telling him that, you know, he was telling me like, oh, now you have a postdoc, it's going to be good, whatever. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm really scared. I feel like after these three years, I won't have anything because like, I feel like, uh, I feel like uh, I'm stuck on something and, uh, you know, I don't know what to do next, you know? And then he was like, wait, and in three years after this, I'll talk to you and let's see how many, how many papers you're going to have. He said, you will be in trouble to have enough time to write papers, he said. And it, it ended up being true, you know? So uh, three years after that, I didn't know which one I should work on because there were just too many, too many papers around. So, uh, so yeah, I think everybody else should, uh, should, uh, should uh, feel the same. Like, you know, if right now you think that you will not have enough ideas to write papers, I think in three years you will be in trouble which one to write. So things, uh, things can change pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, so when you started in Bonn, uh, I mean, Bonn is a town which has more mathematicians than other humans. So how did you not get... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, like even when I take a train in the subway, there are people discussing math. You got the point. <laughs> So how did you manage not to get overwhelmed with all the seminars and all the amazing people around? Uh, I have to say, in some ways, it's quite intimidating. And I was also intimidated. I mean, if you go there, especially from Georgia and uh, in Georgia, I was a very good student. Again, a bit of bragging, but I need to say the fact I thought that I was really good, you know, and then I go there. Um, as a, after my undergrad in Georgia and not that I think I'm not good anymore. I just thought I'm nobody. Like I just do not exist because like people around me, they were, they were like, they knew, first of all, they knew everything. 
they could figure out things much faster. They could, uh, they could give like amazing talks, like all these things. I, mean, I don't want to just name names. I mean, you probably imagine what kind of people I'm talking about. Uh, then you go to the seminars and there are these uh, professors that, uh, you know, know everything and uh, just like get intimidated a bit with this. But then uh, it depends how you, um, and I admit this does exist a bit uh, in Bonn and also maybe in some other places. Uh, but uh, first of all, one thing is that uh, most of these people are still very friendly. The fact that they know so many things and they are so good doesn't mean that uh, you can't talk to them. So if you understand this and you try to use this on your own advantage and like every even stupidest questions you have, you go and ask them. And that's one thing about me. And maybe this is an advice I can give to young people. Don't think that there are stupid questions, you know, like the amount of stupid questions I ask uh, during every day, even sometimes in the chat with my collaborators is, 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 is a lot like, like, uh, uh, yeah, so I used to ask a lot of stupid questions, these people in the very beginning, they were probably extremely stupid questions. But these people were very friendly, very nice, very kind. They would explain to me things, they would give me literature, they would just write down things on blackboard for me. Uh, and also seeing these kind of amazing mathematicians around you uh, motivates you to work hard. So, so I worked very hard to catch up. And somehow I managed, I probably, I still didn't caught up until today with these people, but, but, uh, but, you know, I was at some point on the level to ask them a bit more intelligent questions, let's say. And, uh, and then, uh, then it was very fun. I mean, then, then it became fun to hang out in Bonn. Uh, yeah. Maybe after one year, uh, I was not intimidated anymore to ask anything or, or, or even give talks in front of these people. But yeah, the first year was very, <laughs> Very scary, yeah. Uh, but to find balance in such a situation where there is so much math around you, it's a bit difficult because if you have like, if you're hanging out with people, they constantly talk about math and math, and I am probably also one of one of one of them. Sometimes I also don't stop. Uh, it's always good to do other things, you know, like non-math things, like for example, sports or go and hike or uh, go do something whatever, even watch some movies sometimes and, and turn off your head. And that does help a lot, I think. Yeah, yeah and that, I was doing a lot of that in Bonn, so, so I felt like. And actually, there were some mathematicians I was playing tennis with. And usually we wouldn't talk maths while playing tennis, so, you know. <laughs> Not too bad, after all. Bonn is a very nice place. I really like Bonn. I have to admit that I have uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's in my heart because I spent seven years there. I was always, uh, I always felt very comfortable there. And, you know, like people were so kind to me there that I think I'm a wrong person to criticize Bonn too much, you know. I haven't seen traces of your fame in Bonn, but when I was visiting Copenhagen, I think it was right after you left there as a postdoc, and there were all over like photos of you and <laughs> words of love and affection. Uh, I was very curious who is that guy that everyone is so crazy yeah. about you. What was that? Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, I admit now that in Copenhagen times, I mean, nowadays I like to do that as well, but not as much. But in Copenhagen, I used to do mass, of course, like a lot of mass as everybody else does. But I used to party a lot as well. Like I just partied all the time. I don't know why this city is really nice. I also really like Copenhagen. It's a beautiful city, good people, fun, uh, fun places to hang out. And this fact that we were all these new postdocs and PhD students around together, that was creating some kind of a party atmosphere. So I was partying all the time. And then eventually some of my friends sort of like started to take my pictures while drunk or while hangover or while while smoking a cigarette or something like this. And then eventually they, uh, they, uh, they, they, they made some kind of jokes out of this. And then eventually they started to put up my pictures. I think though, well, I was this one party where I got uh, drunk or something and, uh, and someone took my picture. And then suddenly on this party, like in like 50 different places in the corners of the room, my pictures showed up like glued pictures of mine, you know, printed out glued pieces of mine. And this is, I think, when it started to like sort of make this uh, 
these pictures of mine or something like this. I think the most famous one is, which I think still is hanging in one of the PhD student offices in Copenhagen is like, I have this kind of very angry face like, like that uh, because I'm actually hangover. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in this situation, uh, it's like look really face, angry face, you know, and there is a quote like, you know, that I'm saying, you have to work harder. <laughs> That's kind of a motivational thing for students, you know. <laughs> I think it's still hanging somewhere. But actually, I have met some people like, you know, I've never met before and they look at me like, I know you. I have seen your picture. <laughs> We need that photo for the cover of the video. <laughs> no, please don't do it. It doesn't look good. <laughs> it looks pretty bad. Well, recognizable. It, it looks pretty bad, yeah. But it's uh, it's fun, yeah. Uh, it's funny that you knew that that, that, that those about these pictures, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also had your style week in Copenhagen because I was visiting just for a week and I came to work with my collaborator, but it was the Pride Week. So the whole city was dancing and singing and it was so much fun and joy that this was um, the most unproductive week <laughs> with a collaboration. Yeah, I mean, if there is some party going on in, in, in Copenhagen, it's impossible to work. I mean, they have these like, street street uh, things going on like several times a year or something like that. And you just go out and have fun, you know. And... So there is a collection of alcohol behind you, the whiskey, I can see. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> does alcohol help you to do math? Uh, no, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't. Uh, alcohol never helps me to do math. It slows me down. I'm completely useless even after one beer to do maths. Like I can't do maths under, I have to be really fresh for maths. Uh, really have to be fit and uh, like just not tired, you know? And I don't mean physically tired, like my brain shouldn't be tired. I like to do maths, for example, after three hours playing tennis. I really enjoy doing maths. I'm physically tired, but my brain is feeling great not after alcohol but every time i upload a video on youtube i press the button not for kids and now finally um it turns out helpful um, yeah, because of that, because of that. <laughs> ah, you know kids should uh, kids should learn about scottish whiskey you know it's a it's a it's a very old and traditional drink you know it's a part of scottish culture so uh, why not do you like whiskey um I have a friend who put real effort into making me like this. Ah, I see. But do you like Armenian cognac? No? I was, <laughs> I was, too, like I was too young. My grandfather would have certainly uh, put effort into that, but I was too young. Armenian cognac is very nice. I really enjoy it. Yeah. What about Georgian wine? Have you ever tried Georgian wine? Oh, yeah, that's true. Now I'm interviewing you, you see? I think that's an aspect of math life that I usually miss out on the drinking with mathematicians. So how is it? Tell me, do they discuss math? What's going on? What oh, yeah, it? these are the one of the, I mean, I, when I said I don't do math when I drink, I mean, that's wrong, of course. I really enjoy discussing math when I'm a bit, uh, you know, drinking and stuff because, uh, because then uh, you have to, you become even more free, you know, like to say the stupidest ever things possible and sometimes you come up with some good ideas so or, or some other people come up with good ideas and uh, and it is very fun to discuss math together with uh, drinks i think like there was this famous tradition i think uh, clark barwick had this thing in mit going on a bourbon a bourbon center it uh the at some point i asked my youtube subscribers to offer questions for interviewees there was let me ask you one of them my favorite was <laughs> Yeah, I'm also I'm also a subscriber in the meantime. I subscribe. Oh, great. Come on. <laughs> so there was a question. Directly, are you ready? Yes. It's, it's a serious one. Oh, I'm not ready for serious question. Oh, that's very serious. Do you think that math is actually important with respect to life, death, and love? Oh, that's a... Uh, that's a... Uh, wow, that's like... Uh, that's like an amazing question. I mean, um, uh, I would say no. <laughs> you told me not to answer this yes and no questions, but I would say no. I think that the love and the life are way more important than, than any, the best ever theorem you can put in math. Even though math is very important and don't understand me wrong, but you know, I don't, I don't put it, I don't put it on, on the same level as these three things.
<laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people will criticize me about this. But, you know. <laughs> I'm honest. I'm honest. That's good enough. I wonder if that person would be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, probably not, because maybe this was a uh, this was some sort of a provocation to like make a point about that the mathematicians think so much of themselves that they consider math as important as life and death or something like this. You know, maybe it was a maybe it was a trap. And I didn't fall in that trap. <laughs> maybe. We will figure out what this person is going to comment eventually. Uh, I actually wrote an answer to that question. Oh, nice. What did you say? There is a play by Max Frisch called Don Juan or the Love to Geometry. And I thought if there is an answer, it must be in that play. Is that the Swiss writer? I think I read a book of this guy called Homo Faber. Yeah. Is that the same guy? Yeah, I have not read that book. I should maybe read that. <laughs> But I want to give a talk on a school conference when I'm studying at the university, like a talk for kids at my school called Don John and the love to algebraic geometry. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, people, people like jokes and talks. I think, I think maybe we should give, both of us should give advice to people, make more jokes during talks because that makes the talks <laughs> better. That makes the talks better. Like whatever, whatever you're gonna do, make jokes. Even if you give like worst talk in your life, if you make like three or four jokes in there, the talk's not gonna be that bad, you know. So <laughs> it's a good trick. Make jokes in your talks. Yeah. Do you remember any particularly fun joke from your talk? Fun joke from my talk. Uh, or from any other talk. I I really enjoy, for example, uh like uh and someone i mean i think we we all appreciate this guy a lot and we really we really we, we really like this guy for everything he has done in our our area but also personally lars hasselholt i think makes some great jokes in his talks like absolutely fantastic jokes i mean i think this is this guy is like makes one of the best ones i mean i just remember once this is the once i i just remember this and this was the joke. So he was giving some talk and like, I think he didn't like the way his talk was going. He was just like writing something and was making mistakes and correcting because he's very precise. He doesn't want to write wrong things on the blackboard. And then he wanted to like cheer up people. And he said, I once made a joke on a conference and I looked at us <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and people were dying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one. It's just, I think I think many people remember that one. I think that was like Young Topologies meeting 2016 or something. Everybody attending that meeting, I think, remembers this this uh, phrase by Lars. He just once made a joke on a conference. He didn't say what, but you know, <laughs> just that we would believe that he can be fun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but one should see Lars in this story because, like. With, with no smiling. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, this guy, this guy is amazing. I, I hope he's gonna watch uh, watch uh, watch this video and uh, you know, be happy about the fact that we we love him so much. Oh, we sure do. I think he has been already mentioned several times here. <laughs> yes, he's a very popular guy, mathematically and non mathematically. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I seem to have no shame, you know, just like cut me here and say some stupid things and, uh, and, and present myself on YouTube. Yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> but, you know, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for doing it. I mean, it's fun. I'm not sure watching me will be that much fun, but I think, I think watching the others were, uh, were, was a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's fun. But I do think, I do think that like uh, just having, uh, let's say average mathematicians around just sharing their stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good because that is more encouraging in a way because like you're gonna watch this like you're gonna watch me and like yeah if this guy could do it i can also do it you know that's it you know <laughs> that's not how people will feel people who are not confident in themselves they'll think oh he helped his like classmates in the exams so he was obviously good and then yeah, but i think most money. most 
most of us were pretty good at uh, at, at undergrad. Uh, when, when, and then it took you know, just one year to get used to Bonn with all the like tons of gears around. <laughs> yeah. No, but I also have to say a lot of people helped me. So, so it, it, like, I I have been extremely lucky in my career and in my life that I had support from a lot of people. I don't know why this happened, but I feel like I owe a lot of people a lot of things. I mean, I mean, uh, people were helping me a lot, and I feel like the only way maybe I can return this is to kind of try and help others sometimes, you know because I can't really give anything to them, you know? So uh, they were just generous and helping me and teaching me and, you know, educating me and, and encouraging me. So, uh, so yeah, and going back to Thomas Nikolaus's uh, uh, comment about feedback, I think it's also very important to give feedback to some people and not just write these kind of emails like, eh, wow, wow, great paper, you know, no. If you think it's a great paper, then you should say why you think it's a great paper and you know what what is the thing you like there and, and that kind of stuff. And I think that helps people. It helps people a lot, I think. And and in general, just like being there for uh, more younger people than you who have some questions anytime, basically. Like anyone who would write me now an email, for example, on some random thing in math. I would I would take this very seriously because I feel like I owe this to the community and I think again in some talks this was again mentioned that this is like a community this is a very small community and we have to take care of each other somehow you know uh, because uh, if we don't help each other then nobody else gonna help us so so I think this is one of the main duties of uh, uh, just a normal mathematician that works in this area to be always ready to uh, to uh, discuss math and to to help uh, other uh, people if uh, if possible, uh, I think this is a this is the one of the most important duties uh, that we have.